If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 16 with me. Genesis chapter 16. And while you're turning there, I want to remind you, because we're going to see this in the story today that I'm going to read, the angel of the Lord. And I have... I have told you before, but I want to remind you that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is commonly understood by Bible scholars as what we call a theophany or an appearance, a visible appearance of God, or a more particular, a Christophany, which is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, a pre-incarnate appearance. And We know that the angel of the Lord in this chapter is God or God the Son, uh, Jesus, because he is called the Lord who spoke to her. And uh, you'll see that as I read this. And in the Bible uses the covenant name of God there, Yahweh. And so I'm at Genesis 16. I want to read this to you. Beginning in verse 1. Now Sarai, who later becomes Sarah, Abram's wife, who later becomes Abraham, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maid servant or slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. So she legally became his second wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she she began to despise her mistress. And then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. I want you to understand the tone of this, I believe, is a pretty heated argument. Verse 6, your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar. So she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child. You are now pregnant and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. Sounds a little bit like a Dennis the Menace, doesn't he? His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Now look at verse 13 with me. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke with, who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, El Rohi. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. 
That is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roi, which is translated as the well of the living one who sees me. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him a son. And I want to, I want to talk to you this morning about the God who sees you. The God who sees you. Isn't it wonderful to know that nothing in this life will ever hide you from God's view? Amen. I wonder if I could have you stand for a moment in honor of the reading of God's word. And let me say a prayer over what we're about to do. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the fact that it serves your purpose in us and in our lives. I pray that you would bless the reading of your word and Lord, anoint me as I preach the message you've laid on my heart. I pray that it will be seed that will find good soil and take root in the lives of all who hear. I pray God give me the multitude in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. I love the fact that God sees me. You know, I have, over the past few years, watched something unfold time and time again with various people, and I've even experienced it myself to some degree. And it's something that is one of the most ungodly things I think I've ever seen in my lifetime. I'm talking about a social practice that has become so much a part of our culture that we now have a name for it. It's called cancel culture. How many of you have ever heard that expression? And that's how our culture is now characterized. Cancel culture is just an expression that's used to describe the ostracism of a person from certain social settings or from society itself. Because someone doesn't like this person for whatever reason. And so not necessarily because you've done anything wrong, but just because someone doesn't like you or for whatever reason they just hate you, they begin to bully you. They begin to exclude you and even devalue you as a human being, as a person. You become culturally worthless is kind of the message and how you're treated. You you shouldn't have a voice. You shouldn't have an opinion because you no longer matter in this world. They just cancel you as a person of value. Now, sometimes it takes on very subtle forms. Maybe they just unfriend you on their social media. Just one day this week, I had a friend I hadn't heard from in a long time and, and uh, pulled up their social media and realized, well, I've been unfriended. We're no longer friends. <laughs> And, you know, that may be subtle, but they're, they're saying that you don't matter to them anymore. Sometimes, though, it takes on a much more vicious and hurtful form where you are more publicly attacked and publicly ostracized. And I've experienced that in my lifetime a time or two. And you... You may have done your best to live a good life and make a positive difference in this world, and, but you find yourself being more sort of publicly disregarded and disrespected and rejected only because someone with selfish desires 
does not like you because of what you stand for. You find yourself excluded and shunned, sometimes even by people you've loved and served or who at one time may have even been your friend. And I've noticed that our society has really honed this skill. They're good at it. They'll stir up a gossip campaign against you or they'll, they'll just do things to start rumors or, or, you know, they're just anything they can do to encourage others to get on their bandwagon of casting you aside, of canceling you. And our culture has become so good at canceling someone until they're, they're just no longer even valued as a person. You're kind of viewed as someone who has nothing worth of worth to offer society. And you're seen as someone who is perhaps undeserving of acceptance and unworthy of respect and therefore someone who should be shunned as if you have no place in this world or someone to be ignored as if you just don't even exist in this world. It's like you're not even valued as a human, a person, but you're more like just an object or a thing to be used and cast aside. Of course, there is a spirit behind the cancel culture movement in our society. I don't know if you've ever realized that, but it is antithesis. It is in antithesis to biblical godly love. People are to be valued as those who are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of their creator. That's biblical. And yes, even people that you disagree with. But the cancel culture movement has spread like wildfire in our society until even I've noticed some people who may attend a church somewhere and who self-identify as Christian have taken it upon themselves the task of canceling a person or people who they just don't like or, or don't appreciate anymore. Really, I think to make themselves feel a little bit better or to maybe appease what really is their own guilt. So this world is, is full of people who feel they've been simply canceled from society. They feel rejected, unaccepted, unloved, shunned, cast away like something of no value to anyone. And today I want to introduce you to just such a person whose name is Hagar. And her story occurs in the middle of the story of Abram and Sarai, or Abraham and Sarah. And please forgive me if I use their names interchangeably. I, I sometimes refer to Abram as Abraham and Sarai as Sarah. And her story occurs in the middle of the story of Abraham and Sarah. And I'll be honest, when we, when we see the story of Hagar, we don't usually think of her with a warm, fuzzy feeling, do we? Because she represents the mistake that was made by Abram and Sarai when they became impatient with God in giving them a son of promise. So Hagar is not really, let me just say, I do not recommend to you doing what Sarai and Abram did in this chapter of Genesis. The fact that it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's right or good to do. So Hagar is not really so much a person to us. She is the mistake. She is the mistake in the story. In fact, this may be the first time you've ever heard me preach a sermon on Hagar. We just don't focus on her much. She, it is through her and her son Ishmael that we have the Arab nations and the Islamic faith. 
So she's not usually viewed as a matriarch of the Christian faith. Are you with me? But if you've ever been canceled, if you've ever felt rejected and worthless as a person, you need to hear the message of the God who sees you. And let me begin by introducing you to Hagar, who is a woman who was forsaken in the desert. When we are introduced to Hagar in Genesis chapter 16, we immediately begin to get a picture of her life. She is introduced to us as an Egyptian slave belonging to Abram's wife, Sarai. We don't know how she came to be a slave, but to be sure, nobody came to be a slave by choice. I promise that no little girl ever had a childhood dream of growing up to be a slave. In fact, it was generally through some unfortunate circumstances that a person, that a woman would become a slave, perhaps the death of a husband and having no family to support her. And it was probably one of only two ways that she could survive in this world, either by prostitution or by slavery. So we can already surmise that she has had a difficult life and that she has already come through many painful experiences to get to this place in life where we find her in Genesis 16. It's not a far stretch of the imagination to see her as a person who already feels pretty down on herself. Someone with low self-esteem, a person who has little or no self-confidence. Hagar is probably not someone who has a lot of dreams and goals in life. She's not a person of great influence. She's not someone other people look up to with a great deal of respect. And that makes it even more painful to listen into the conversation that Sarai has with Abram as she talks to him about Hagar. In fact, it almost seems to me that you can sense her attitude as there might be some blaming of God here in her words when she says, the Lord has kept me from having children. You almost get a sense of her displeasure with God for her own childlessness. But as the conversation continues, you have to notice that nowhere in this passage of Scripture does Abram or Sarai refer to Hagar by name. All through their conversation, she is simply my slave or your slave, as if she has no personal identity. Hmm. I wonder if it could be because she was younger and maybe more attractive than Sarai, who would have been about 75 years old at this time. Maybe there was some jealousy between from in Sarai's heart. But whatever the reason, Hagar is viewed as a thing. An object, just just some property, just a surrogate just a thing to be used by Sarai so that I can build a family for myself through her since God has kept me from having children. Even a little further in the conversation, in the story, after Abram had slept with her and she became pregnant, notice they still refuse to use or refer to her by name as they argue about her. Sarah said to her husband, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms. And now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And when Abram replies, he says, well, your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. 
I mean, it's like she's not even a person. And so Sarai mistreated Hagar. She began to look down on her and browbeat her and treat her in every way with utter disdain and loathing and disrespect. How many of you have ever been talked about? Raise your hand. Have you ever been argued over? And have you ever been in the same house or in the same room and you feel like looking at the people who are talking about you and saying, hello, I'm here and I can hear you. Imagine being in the same house, maybe even in the same room as these two people are arguing and you are the topic of their argument and neither one of them will even refer to you by name. You're not even a person to them. You're spoken of as though you have no value as a human being. Understand that when she gave her servant to Abram, by law, she became his second wife, but Neither of them is treating her as a wife. In fact, they're not even really treating her like they're supposed to treat a slave. Hagar is there in the house, perhaps in the very room with them, hearing them argue over her, and she doesn't even have an identity to them as a person. She's an object to be used so Sarai can get what she wants, and Sarai is mistreating her more and more. You know, I'm sure Hagar didn't want to be a slave. And notice it was never her idea to make herself a wife to Abram. So I want you to understand that she did not choose the circumstances that she is in for herself. She's done nothing wrong to be so hated and so abused and so devalued as a human, as a person. And as they argue over her, within her hearing, it's no wonder she began to despise her mistress, Sarai. I probably would too. So Hagar fled from Sarai into the desert to a place beside the road to Shur, where she stopped to rest next to a spring of water, a well. And this tells us something more about her identity as a person. Her name Hagar, while it seems to be of foreign origin, has come to be known as a Hebrew name, meaning forsaken or flight. She is forsaken, so she flees into the wilderness. Someone who is abandoned or deserted. I wonder how many people in this world who've been deserted or who've been abandoned, I wonder, I wonder how many people feel that. I wonder how many people there are in this world like Hagar who, who feel that just because of circumstances they've inherited this life where they feel that they have no value, where they, they feel they have no worth to offer in this world. And I wonder how, many, wonder how many children go to sleep at night hearing their parents argue about them. I wonder how many of them are referred to by some term other than their Christian name. I wonder how many people have been mistreated and treated as nothing more than a thing to be hated and despised and rejected. And if that's you, I want to say something to all the Hagars in this world who are listening to me right now, who are struggling over a sense of value and self-worth. I want you to hear me. While nobody else in the room wanted to call her by name. It is there in the desert next to this spring beside the road to Shur 
that the Bible says the Lord found her. And when he found her, the God who created her called her by name. God gave her worth. You're not a thing, you're a person. And you may feel worthless and rejected and forsaken by those around you. You may feel life has no value or purpose. Your life has no value or purpose. But the God of all creation who created you knows your name. And, and the Bible says that he even knows the number of your days and he even knows the number of the hairs on your head. That one has always amazed me. I mean, this is the God that the Bible says flung the stars into the heavens and calls each of them by names. He, he, by their names. He knows the names of billions and billions of stars and he also knows your name, Hagar, and he will find you and make himself known to you. Oh, what a wonderful thought that God came down from heaven to find her. I'm telling you, you have value to God. He knows your name and he will find you wherever you are. So when he found her, the Lord gave her a promise for the future. And I want to talk about the promise for the future. But I, I, want to, I have to talk to you, Hagar, about facing the past. You know, I've read this for years and it, it, it you know, God tells her to go back. Almost seems cruel, doesn't it? But the next thing I noticed in this conversation that she gets to have with God, others were talking about her, but God came to talk with her. I've been talked about, and I think it was unanimous when I asked that you, you all have been talked about. There's nothing like being the, the subject at the dinner table after church, that preacher, Others were talking about her, but God came to talk with her. And keep in mind, she's an Egyptian. She's not even a Hebrew. Who is she that God, who spoke to the prophets, would want to come to her, an Egyptian? And the Lord asked her two questions that are important for you to hear and consider if you can relate to Hagar. And I want you to look at verse 8. God asked her, Hagar, where have you come from? And where are you going? Now, let me tell you something. God, God didn't ask her that because he didn't know where she came from. And he didn't ask her where she was going because he didn't know her future. God's not asking her where she used to live and where she's traveling from to here <laughs> or where she's traveling to from here. These two questions really had, I think, little or nothing at all to do with geography, but they had everything to do with her past and her future. <clears throat> Notice with me that Hagar only has an answer to the first question. She never answered the second one. I'm running from my mistress, Sarah. Hagar, Hagar basically says, I'm running from my past. My past is just too hard. It's too much. It's too difficult. I cannot deal with it. And when we cannot deal with it, sometimes the only thing we know to do is run. And so she is running from her past, but she has no answer concerning her future. She does not know where to go from here. It's, it's possible that she was headed back to Egypt, but that was a long way away. And she didn't know how she could get there with no supplies. 
You know, there are a lot of people in this world like Hagar who know all too well where they came from. They know their past, but they have no idea where they're going. And therefore, they have no idea how to get there from here. So Hagar was focused on her past, but God was about to give her a future. God always has a future for you, and I want you to wrap your mind around that. But to get there, there's something you have to do. And so the Lord told her to go back to your mistress and submit to her. Go back and submit to the person who's abusing you and mistreating you. Why why in the world would God send her back home to her now husband and the other wife? Because running from problems never fixes them. I think, I think, you know, running from your past doesn't take it away. I think for one thing, and this has troubled me as I've read this passage of Scripture over the years, why God would send her back. But, you know, I think God wanted Hagar to do the right thing because doing the right thing is never, the, doing the wrong thing is never the right thing to do. Did I say that right? God wanted Hagar to do the right thing because doing the wrong thing is never the right thing to do. But also, I think, I believe God wanted to use Hagar to work in Sarai. I mean, just for a moment, just pretend with me. Put yourself in that home. Look at the look on Sarai's face when Hagar came home. I mean, she thought she was rid of Hagar. And I think God said, I've got a plan for Sarah. I want you to go back home. And and to me, that says God wanted to use Hagar. Hagar had a significant purpose in God's plan for the salvation of of mankind. But even more than that, God told her to go back and deal with her problems instead of running away from them because God wanted to give her a future that she had never dreamed she would have. And the Lord told her she was pregnant, and although he meant that that was very literal, that she was pregnant with a baby, I want you to understand for a moment that the word pregnant itself is also a word that speaks of something that is rich in blessings. You are You are pregnant with a future. You are pregnant with blessings. And God began to explain to her the blessings which she was pregnant with. First of all, you who were nothing but an Egyptian slave with no husband and no family to care for you, you're going to have a son. And even more than that, I'm going to increase your descendants until they're too many to count. And so for a woman who had nothing... She was about to have everything. So to someone, let me just encourage you to face your past, deal with your problems, don't run from them, and God will bless you with a future. And then what happens next is just incredible to me, and I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the name of this God. Get the picture. Here is Hagar, an Egyptian slave, wandering alone in the desert. She was used, really, by her husband and by his first wife. She was loathed, devalued as a person, treated like an object, just a piece of property, a surrogate for Sarai to get what she wanted. Now she's homeless and pregnant with no husband who cares for her, with no supplies to make a long journey through the wilderness. Her life feels every bit of what her name declares her to be, forsaken. But the Lord finds her. I just get this picture of the Lord coming from heaven in a pre-incarnate appearance 
and finding her. And now here she is having a conversation with the one true living God of all creation, a God whose name she doesn't even seem to know because she's an Egyptian. But he's a God who had heard of her misery, came to find her and have conversation with her and to bless her in the days ahead. And so, so what's the big deal? And, and, you know, God spoke to a lot of people in the Bible. He even had close personal conversations with some. But this time is different, and this just stands out to me as I read this story. This time it's different. This time it's not a prophet that God's speaking to. It's not even some Jewish leader of God's people. In fact, this, by the way, is the first appearance in Scripture of the angel of the Lord, the first Christophany we see in the Bible. And it's not... It's not to a prophet that he appears. It's not, listen, it's not even to a man that he appears. And it's not even to a Jew that he appears in this way. Remember, she's an Egyptian and even a slave. And so no wonder she doesn't know God's name. Did you know that the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, had over 1,400 gods and goddesses in their culture? Over 1,400 different gods and goddesses. So it's no wonder that she didn't seem to know the name of this God who actually heard her misery, found her in the desert, appeared to her, and talked with her. And I'm sure Hagar had known about a lot of gods in her lifetime. But she had never known this God. She knew this God was not any of those gods that she had ever prayed to because none of those gods had ever talked to her after all. They were just made of wood and stone. So they had no ears to hear and no voice to speak. But this God has an appearance. He could move and talk. This God was real. And he cared for her, even though she is just an Egyptian slave. And the oh man, the things that he says to her, it must have made her head spin. You're pregnant. You, you're going to have a son. You'll, his name is going to be Ishmael, which means God hears. Because I've heard you. I heard you crying. Even when you didn't know who to pray to, I heard of your misery. This God is standing in front of her, talking to her. This God, by the way, even cares about her unborn baby. She's only one of four people in the Bible who ever heard such a covenant blessing directly from the mouth of God. He's not like any of the other gods that she had heard of in Egypt. So she's sitting there, standing there, wondering, who is this God. In the Old Testament, God would reveal himself to his people by various names that would minister to their need at the time. For, for instance, to a, to a shepherd boy who would one day be king, God revealed himself as Yahweh Reah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In Exodus 15, he revealed himself to his people as, as Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals all of your diseases. And to help them to see that he would provide for them, God revealed himself as Yahweh Jireh, the Lord who provides. And when they needed peace, he was Yahweh Shalom. The Lord is your peace. And by many names, he revealed himself to his people. But I want to tell you something I don't know if you've ever realized. But as far as I know, and I've read the Bible through many times, in every instance where one of God's names is revealed in Scripture, it is God who is providing his name to his people. With the exception of one time, and it's this time. This is the one place where 
a human, a person, actually names God. And it's an Egyptian slave giving God his name. Standing there wondering who he must be, knowing that he is God. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, El Roi. You are the God who sees me. Maybe someone who is listening to me knows what it's like. Maybe you've felt forsaken. You may feel alone in the desert with no supplies and no one who cares about you. Maybe you've been ostracized, and shunned, rejected. Even though you've tried your best, but it just seems like your life no longer has any purpose or significance or worth. Let me introduce you to El Roi, the God who sees you. David, he had been alone in the wilderness with the sheep, even found himself hiding in a cave to survive. And he came to realize something. He said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're already there. If I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. And if I say, oh, the darkness is going to hide me from you. And you won't be able to see me. You, you won't be able to find me, David said. But even still, the darkness will be like light to you, God. Because you're the God who sees me. This is the God who sees you. And there is no place that you can go where God cannot find you. And there is no darkness too dark that God cannot see you. This is the name that speaks of God's omniscience, his all-knowingness. It means that there is nothing you have in life, nothing about you or about your life that God doesn't know. There's nothing that you'll ever go through that God does not see and know. He even has the hairs of your head numbered. That is the God who can see you no matter what. That's the God who can deliver you, provide for you, give you a future bring you safely into his purpose for the days of your life. That's the God who will never forsake you, Hagar. Go home, face your problems, because you can trust that God. I just imagine this Egyptian woman for the rest of her days telling people about this God of the Hebrews I imagine her maybe witnessing to some of her Egyptian friends. And I imagine them asking her, well, wh wh what God are you talking about? Which God? And I just I imagine her saying, I, look, I don't know. I don't know everything about him. I just, I wasn't raised a Hebrew, but all I know is he is the God who sees me. And she went home to her husband, Abram. And by the way, in the end, her marriage to him was not a fairy tale marriage. We find the rest of her story in Genesis 21, beginning in verse 8, where we see that Sarah had given birth to Isaac, and she told Abraham, and listen, still refusing to call her by name, he said, she said to her husband, you get rid of that slave woman and her son. She won't even refer to Ishmael by name. For that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. And the Bible says it distressed Abraham greatly, but interestingly, God told him to listen to Sarah. So he gave her some food and a skin of water, and in the morning she went on her way, and soon the water ran out as she wandered in the desert with her son. The Bible says she put the boy under some bushes, under one of the bushes, and she went off a little distance, about a bow shot away. 
sat down nearby some distance because she didn't want to watch her son die. But here comes the God who sees. The Bible says she began to sob. And I wonder, you know, she needed water. I wonder if she was thinking, where is the well of the living one who sees me? And the Bible says God heard the boy crying and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, had another conversation with her. He said, what's the matter, Hagar? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Remember, his name means God, hear God hears. He said, lift the boy up, take him by the hand. For I will make him into a great nation. God doesn't forget the promises of blessings he's made. And then God opened her eyes. And guess what she saw? A well of water. This is the well of the one who lives and sees me. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert. He became an archer. And his mom got him a wife from Egypt. But God kept his promise to Hagar. Now listen, I, I felt in my heart that someone listening to this message, someone who feels rejected and ostracized and forsaken, that's a, just a good word to describe it. I felt that someone needed to hear that God sees where you are he knows what you've been going through. He cares for you. He has, he has promised that he will never forsake you. And while you've been hidden and alone and you may feel like nobody cares, nobody's with you, God knows everything you're going through because he truly is the God who sees you. And he will forever see you. Would you stand with me? If that's you, I want to pray for you. And if you're watching our program, message me. I'll pray for you. I'm going to pray for people who are here and who are watching our program because I know somebody needed to hear this. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. I, I'm, I thank you for caring. There are so many people who are pushed aside and just canceled in this world. They've been canceled by maybe family members or friends that have just rejected them, unfriended them, devalued them. Society has a way of just devaluing people. But God, I lift up everyone who has heard this message that may be struggling with this. And I pray that this day you would make yourself known to them. I pray that you will find them in their desert. I pray that you will speak to their heart and help them to understand the promises that you, you have for them in the future, that you have a future for them. Those who are feeling hopeless I pray that you will give them hope. And I pray that this day, God, those who feel alone in this world will understand and know you as the God who sees me. And Lord, I pray this word will take root in them and grow in them and that they will come to know you as their Lord and Savior and that they will surrender their heart and life to you. Now, I pray that you bless these people, God, as we prepare to leave your sanctuary. And I pray that we will walk in the Spirit this week and use us to reach a hungry and lonely world. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.